open up? Okay, absolutely. Oh, no, no. I was yeah, right. Whenever you're ready. Good morning. I'm Steve Clinton. I'm the Associate Dean for the School of Business. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our guests for this morning's session, uh, primarily because back in November when I first floated the idea of Brand U as the theme for this year's Business Week, our presenter, Rich Archer, probably is that you or me? <laughs> let, let me turn this off. He, he was the uh, first one to jump on board and immediately What's going on here, Ray? <laughs> we'll try that. Anyway, he was the first one to jump on board and said that he wanted to be involved in Business Week. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rich Archer from KPMG. Thank you. Ah, I haven't spoken yet, so uh, save the applause. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the School of Business for a number of years on the Board of Visitors. Um, myself, from an introduction standpoint, I'm an alumni. Um, I was thinking on the drive here, it was 83 that I graduated, so lots of buildings weren't here. Hopefully some of you were born, but um, it's been a few years um, since I graduated, but really have enjoyed being involved with the university. It's phenomenal what has gone on here. Um, if you don't have an appreciation of both the faculty, the expansion, and just everything that the school has done, uh, School of Business as well as the university itself. Um, from a background standpoint myself, um, I've worked at a number of jobs. Uh, the one interesting thing and, and the one area I appreciate about Robert Morris is it's a very interdisciplinary type of background in education. When I was going to school, it was Robert Morris College all about business, so all of the programs related to business. Um, I was in the business information systems, so prior to the internet and the explosion of dot com and everything else, uh, when those big machines, the mainframes were in vogue, um, that's what we were learning. Um, and it's been, served me very, very well. So I think this university gives you an education that is certainly adaptable, changeable, and something that's very valuable as you go out in the world. Um, as he said, I, I work for KPMG, I work in an area called advisory. So we do consultative type of work uh, with organizations. I've been with the firm 18 years, worked a couple other places as well. So just a little bit of background, and that will become more pertinent as we get into this. Aha. And something will undoubtedly go wrong. Either my laptop's gonna explode or this thing's gonna burn up in my hand because as, as Steve and I said, we plugged in my laptop, it immediately came up. I plugged in the advanced thing and it just all worked. And technology never works that way. So what we're gonna cover today, it's a little bit different. Um, have you gone to other sessions this week? Mm, folks, yeah? I see you got breakfast, so it's not just the food you came for, I'm hoping as well. But today's the last day. Um, it's still early, so I hope you've had coffee. I'm gonna try and keep it a little light. Um, I like to wander around, so if you don't mind, I'm just gonna be here and there. Um, I, I don't like folks that stand behind the podium, present all stiff and whatever. Um, let's have a little fun. Today's topic is a little bit different. I'll give you some background as to why. Here's what we're gonna talk about. Give you some overview and purpose of what we're gonna talk about today. What are unwritten rules? And I'll give you some background as to where this came from and the, the germination of it. I'm gonna go through each of the points. I don't have them listed up here. I've got eight unwritten rules. There could be 10, 
There could be 50. There's a lot more that we could talk about. But these are some key elements that I wanted to share with you. A summary and then key takeaways as well. Um, so where did this come from? Uh, I've been fortunate enough that KPMG, and this is actually one of the elements we'll talk about today, um, and again, from my Robert Morris days, one of the things I was taught by the, the faculty as well as my experiences here is you should stick up your hand and speak up. If there's something you want, if there's an opportunity, um, and you should be proactive and very positive, and we'll talk about that as the elements today. And so uh, when I joined the firm, it was in 1998, they said, hey, we want somebody to be involved as a national instructor in a program in the practice I was involved with called information risk management. And I said, sure, I like to do that. No problem speaking, as you can tell, I'm a natural born ham, not a problem. So I got involved with that and it was a phenomenal experience because what we had tried to do, we were bringing in people who had experience to join the firm. And anytime you have people who have experience, they bring baggage, they have their own views and standpoints and we tried to build a common framework and a common shared experience so that we'd all at least be coming from it and working with our clients from a similar perspective. So that national experience, that national instructor pool was a great experience for me. At the same time, what was interesting is, since we have this mix of people who had been successful in jobs in other positions, other companies, we started to look at and say, there's a shared value at KPMG there's a set of objectives. There's a way to be successful, to rise in the ranks. And again, one of the things that to keep in mind as I speak with you today is my perspective is from what we call professional services, which is what KPMG and Deloitte and PwC, IBM, all the rest of us do, in that we provide services to our clients. So I'm always working with clients. I'm always working with individuals at my clients at various levels throughout it. I'm involved in selling those services, and we'll talk about that selling. So it's not, you know, hey buddy, wanna buy an audit? Here's, you know, as we used to say, the fuller brush salesman, but none of you would know what that is probably, but I'm not doing the hard sell with a used car. It's a different kind of selling as well. So my perspective and what I wanna share with you today comes from that angle. However, whether you're in engineering, whether you're a pure neuro accountant, IT, whether you're in medical profession, whatever profession you are, the elements that we'll talk about today in terms of presenting yourself, characteristics, selling yourself, selling your team, interacting with folks are very applicable in all cases. We wanna talk about those shared objectives of value, but one of the, the, the strange things, one of the more interesting things that when you work for a big company that often happens is that they squeeze all the fun out of it. We'll talk about that too, which is they take discussions of shared value, objectives, how to be success, and they turn it into the fancy little laminated cards that the HR people come in and talk about. And nothing against HR people, some of my best friends. One of my stints in the past, I worked as a director in HR. So my first love, gotta love them. But because we have to apply it to the masses, we squeeze the fun out of it and make it you know, thou shalt do this, and you shall do this, and you establish goals, and goals say this, and objectives say this, and mission says this, and you have a one, two, three rating scheme, and we have to write them up and put them in. Where's the fun in that? And so I was very fortunate to be in a big company, but be in a very small sphere. There were 300 of us nationally in this practice, and so we had the opportunity to make it a little more fun. So as you, we go through today, and I talk to you, and we've given, I've given a title to each of them, we did this, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, so keep that in mind. You're not gonna see these in your typical business book. What are the unwritten rules? Well, as I said already, we had folks who came and joined us from different aspects, as well as, I do a lot of campus hiring over the years. We're, my team in Pittsburgh, and I'm based here locally, fortunate, I've never had to live anywhere else, born and raised. Some of my Ewans are from way back, bleed, black and gold, so if you have another fan base, then you can leave now, but um, from that standpoint, I'm always asked the question, and you may or may not be aware when you're in the big four, or some even, I think IBM may have this term too, the top is a partner. How do you get to be a partner? How do you get to be a senior manager? I'm just joined as a campus hire. How do I advance along? How can I showcase my talents? How can I be successful? However you define success, 
The interesting thing to me is, and there's a lot of talk about millennials versus old timers like myself, you know, what motivates, what drives. So however you define success, whether it's the acquisition of skills, whether it's the advancement in terms of title, whether it's good old money, let's be frank, it's a motivator. Mm, I like to pay the bills. I got kids in college, I like to pay their tuition bills. So how do I do that? And that's what these unwritten rules of success are intended to be. Now, we developed them and thought about them and pulled them together as it relates to KPMG. But what I want to share with you today, I think, is ubiquitous in that it can apply to all of us. So let's get started with number one. A and the format that I've got here, I've got it at the top. A couple illustrative points. And the, the fact that I've got less bullet points per slide will become important later, and one of them we'll talk about. And then I want to provide some color commentary as well as just some discussion. The first one is success breeds freedom. So what do we mean here? I've been fortunate in my career to work for some very good bosses, work for some very good companies. I think that I have done well and attempted to achieve. I would let you be the judge of whether I'm an overachiever or not. I'm sure all of you are. And I know you are because I went to the presidential Council's dinner last fall, David Jamison got up and gave resumes of some of the top students, and I know that I could not get accepted to this university now. I'm just not smart enough and as, as, as a way over the top as all of you no doubt are. At the same time, when you work for a company, when you work for a team, when you work for a boss, if you are proactive and you get things done and you do things on time and turn in your time report and get your status done and get the assignments done, you will be termed successful. And just like I have four children, great kids, right? I worry about some of them more than others, and the ones I don't worry about, why don't I worry about them? Because I know they'll be in and curfew. I know that when they take the car, they go where they go. I know that they go to the work. I know that they get their work done. Overachievement equals less scrutiny. I suspect all of you have parents of one form or another, and if you do well, and you don't give them grief, they don't breathe down your neck. Bosses are very much the same, as are team leads, as are companies. As you are successful, and you can see my second bullet point, businesses are outcomes oriented. As I said, I work in professional services. We do projects for our companies, the clients that I work with. They want to see outcomes. If we're assessing the security of an organization, and I have a report that's due on February 29th, my client wants to see it then. If you work for a team, if you came and worked for my team, and you had some assessment to get done, interviews to get done, we call them working papers, but some report to get done, you get that done consistently, on time, on budget, and a day early, you wind up with freedom in that I'm not going to be breathing down your neck, scrutinizing how you spend your time, micromanaging you. So lesson number one, certainly success breeds the freedom to get into other areas and the freedom from being micromanaged. This is an interesting one. Number two, your best isn't good enough. And, and this actually goes back to my days being at Robert Morris as well. And I can remember being in class and some of my fellow students coming in and saying, I studied all weekend for the, for the final. Oh, it was so egregious. I spent so much time. Take the final a week later, they barely passed. And then hearing them whine to the professor, but I studied, I studied for 20 hours, 25 hours, a whole week, whatever. And the professor saying, well, that was nice. Good for you. You put in effort, but clearly it wasn't the right effort. Someone else who maybe studied less and in fact got an A. Effort doesn't always equal successful outcomes. Trying doesn't equal doing. Again, I'll go back, business is outcomes oriented. One of the most frustrating things when you work with a team, or even as a member of a team, can be someone who says, well, I'll try my best to get that done. That's nice. 
but by next Monday, we have to have an assessment, we have to have a report, we have to have something accomplished. Trying is nice, but what we need to do is get it done. Consequently, your best isn't good enough, and as Yoda might say, don't try, do. Because the reality is, in any of our worlds in business, whether you work for KPMG in one of my teams, or whether you work in some other company, the deadlines, the goals you have, try as you might, you still have to get that done. I have to provide something to a client. Uh, I came out of Robert Morris working for Mellon Bank uh, back in the day when it was just Mellon and we were doing programming. We had specific deadlines for certain new functions, features uh, as a programmer. They have to be done. There is no try, there's do. This next one, under commit, and over deliver. I think that's a life lesson, whether you're thinking about with your mom, grandmother, especially when it comes to bosses, but in particular what for my world when it comes to clients. And what I mean here is don't say that you can do something by a certain date, within a certain framework, within a certain timeline, whatever that might be. Particularly for me, as I talk to clients, for a certain dollar amount and I can get it done in four weeks when in fact I know that'll be a stretch. I know that it'll be difficult and not just difficult, I know it borders on being impossible. Don't do that. Under commit. Meaning I, I, if, if I'm thinking that it's a five week project, you're thinking that you can take on that next assignment, you can be the vice chairman of something, under commit and over deliver. Very important as it comes to your bosses and as you start to work in the business world as well, we're a cascading as I think about it. The commitments that my team members make roll up to the managers, roll up to the senior managers, ultimately roll up to me and roll up to my chief financial officer or whomever I'm committed to at my client. So if one of my team members stretches and the other team members stretch and they think they can get it done in four weeks when in fact we know it'll take them six weeks, now I'm under the gun. I'd rather say it'll take us eight weeks, deliver in the six weeks, and guess what? Everybody's happy. If you talk to anybody that lives in my household, this second bullet point is just so key. Expectation management. I think that's a life skill. Whether you're talking about going to dinner this weekend with mom, right? So. My mom lives in Ohio, it's a little hard to get to. If I tell mom that I'm coming to dinner on Sunday and then something happens Friday, I can't get there, what do you think mom's gonna be? Disappointed, right? I, I need to manage those expectations. Look at it, uh, Bob Villa says measure twice, cut once. So I better check my calendar two or three times. Same as expectations with your boss, same as expectations with your significant other or anyone else. You need to manage those expectations. It's critical in my client service, client delivery role as well. I need to be able to understand the expectations, actively manage them, work through them, and make sure. It's no different than with your professors, I would suspect. So if you have a paper to write or anything else as well, this is critical. The other thing is your credibility. So we've already talked about success breeds freedom. So how do I get to success? How do I get to being seen as doing a good job? Under commit and over deliver. So your personal credibility. Again, regardless of my commitment as, as, a, as a partner in my firm to my client and how they'll hold me accountable, your individual credibility is just key to building your success within whatever job setting. Again, whether it's with a firm like mine, whether it's within a startup, Regardless, your ability to act on this, under commit and over deliver is key. Everybody know this guy? Who? Come on, tell me who. I know. Dr. Sheldon Cooper, right? Anybody watch The Big Bang Theory? Yeah. Why do you watch it? Because this guy's obnoxious, right? Part of the part of the the draw is that 
Dr. Sheldon Cooper knows everything. Knows everything, doesn't understand sarcasm, right? So he's the guy who will tell you, you weren't exactly right. Blue isn't exactly the shade of the sky today. It's more a lavender, pink, whatever, right? And it's funny, ha, 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 right? Guess what? There's a lot of these guys running around out there. And frankly, nobody likes a weirdo. You'll work with these guys. I work with Joe. This predates a number of you, but when the internet was young relative to being shared within a corporate environment, there were a lot of jokes that went around, a lot of little clever, what you would call apps these days. And one of them was hamster in, in a microwave. And it was just people put out things because they could. And so it was something, it was a, in essence a screensaver, but you play with it. So you could turn the microwave up and blow up the hamster, in essence, in the microwave. It was a cartoon, it wasn't real. So it wasn't like the cat video. So it was this little cartoon. And, and people would have those kind of screensavers to kill time, to waste time when the boss wasn't around. And so we were sitting at a table, much like this one right here, one day at the office talking. And, and I said, oh yeah, did anybody see that, that hamster in the microwave app? And Joe says, well, Rich, I'm not quite sure that you're correct about that. Joe, what are you talking about? He goes, well, anyone who knows about quadrupeds, which are four, would know that a hamster, in fact, has a long tail. That could only have been a, um, a gerbil because gerbils have short tails. And so you clearly just didn't focus on what that little animal was. Okay, flash forward to lunchtime. I said, Joe, let's, let's chat between friends. I said, don't ever do that again. Because nobody at the table cared if it was a gerbil, a hamster, a shark, a warthog. Like, why would you do that? Don't be that guy. <laughs> and, and with all deference to the women or others in the room, I don't mean man, woman, or whatever. If the building's on fire and I should go out the left door, not the right door, absolutely. Be the smartest person in the room. Tell everybody go out the left door. If it's a gerbil, not a hamster, in a cartoon that nobody cares about, don't be that guy. One of the key applications of this, aside from annoying your coworkers, is that if you're in a setting with a client, in my world, and again, it could be a client, it could be fellow colleagues at your company from different departments, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Don't do that. Don't be that guy because what will happen is you will degrade your credibility, your individual ability to interrelate with others because nobody likes a weirdo. And I say that tongue in cheek, but no one likes to be put down, disputed, told that they're wrong. So don't be Dr. Sheldon Cooper. On the heels of that, one of the key things when you work with a team, when you work with a group, and you all will, even if you create your own company or are hugely successful, at some point you'll have to hire other people. So the people that you work with and the organizations you work with, make yourself easy to work with. We have a saying in our industry, it's beyond just KPMG, people like to work with, and consequently buy services from, employ my company, we get to help them, from people they like, people they like to work with, people they want to work with and be around. And that holds true regardless of whether you're in my world where I sell projects and work with projects with clients, or whether you're in the accounting department or trying to do year-end close with a group of other people. When I'm at my clients, I worked with uh, Freddie Mac down in Washington, D.C., and I see how they interrelate, my client people who work there all the time. They work in teams. They work together. They have to interrelate. Individuals don't have to make themselves easy to work with. But when you do that, there's something I call the personal network, and we talk about that at our firm because we're a big company. Whether you're Alcoa, whether you're Westinghouse Electric, they're all big companies with lots of people. You want to be the person that's known as, hey, you know what, if you need something about IT technology risk, which is actually one of my personal areas of expertise, call Rich. We had Rich on a project two months ago. 
He seemed to know his stuff, but more importantly, he wasn't Sheldon Cooper. He wasn't hard to work with. He shared his ideas, and we got a lot out of it. Plus, he connected us with some other folks who seemed to add to the team as well. You want to be that person. Personal referrals are key to success. Again, whether you work in my world or whether you work in any other environment. You want people at the company, you want people in your team, you want the bosses to say, I want to work with that person. I want that person on my team. Because I can assure you, being where I am now in my career path and in my, just the, the years that I've worked, those conversations take place. They don't take place in front of you, they take place in other places. When we say, hey, we, we got to build a team. Um, we're going to go do this. In fact, I remember this at Mellon Bank. Um, again, predates you, but Mellon went on a buying spree in the 1980s. They had a whole project around building multi-company capabilities. They put a lot of teams together to address those integration needs. And the bosses talked about who would be best to be on those teams. Who would be easy to work with? Who would do a good job? who would be proactive, and who would get things done. Pretty key attributes in any area. We do that now when I put together, when we sell a major project. So as an example, um, I deal with healthcare regulatory compliance. We sold a project to the NFL. Kind of neat stuff. I got a waiting list 50 people long of folks who want to work on that, big surprise. So I can pick who I want. Who am I talking about that I want? I want someone who's easy to work with. I'm going to pe pull people onto that team that undercommit and overdeliver. This one is titled Shut Up because it started with shut, insert expletive here, up. Uh, because because uh, we are all smart people. And you, you see it's titled Shut Up, so it's completely politically correct. So. Hopefully I haven't offended anyone on that front. One of the challenges when you work for a company, and I'm sure you all will, given my prior comments, and given what all of your professors say about everybody, all the students here, you'll go to work for a, a company, a good company, maybe a big company, maybe a small good company, whatever it might be, and you'll work with other very smart people. And what do smart people like to do? They like to share their ideas. They want to talk about that. They want to get together. Except everybody can't talk at once. And frankly, in my world, and again, whether it's you're on my team and we're presenting to a client, or whether you're on the accounting team or the IT team or whatever it is, and you're presenting to others or interacting with them, it has been scientifically proven that you can't listen to the other person if you're running your mouth. And in my world, this is key because we are defining and attempting to understand what my clients want, what their priorities are, what their goals are, so that we can help them achieve those goals. If you genericize that, that's pretty applicable to any work environment. And I will tell you that when you get together with other smart people in a team, everyone will want to talk about that. In my environment, we have something we call orals, oral presentations. So I submit a proposal, a company likes it, they call me in because they want to do what I call the personality litmus test. Again, can I work with you? Can I work with your team? And so we'll spend an hour together. I have one coming up next week in Cleveland with a uh, healthcare insurance company. They want me to bring the team in, talk with them for an hour. What are you going to do? What's your approach? How do you work? What they're doing is trying to figure out, am I going to be easy to work with? Am I going to mesh well with their chemistry? If I talk for that whole 60 minutes, am I going to listen? Am I going to be able to listen to anything that they say relative to what's critical to them, what's important to them? And frankly, go back to previous point, which was people like to work with and buy from, people that they like. People love talking about themselves. I took the Dell Carnegie course early in my career. And one of the things they talk about there is people love to talk about what they've done in their life or their kids, their grandkids, their accomplishments, whatever that might be. 
shut up and indulge us. If you find yourself in a meeting where we're sharing information and attempting to discern something about another company, another group, even if it's just another person, and you find yourself talking too much, shut up and listen. Because there will always be plenty of time to get your point across later or to share those ideas. However, if you come off as the person who, again, the smartest person in the room, who talks ad nauseum and doesn't give the other person the, the opportunity to interject or talk, you lose, regardless of how smart you may have sounded, regardless of the validity and credibility of your point, you lose in that transaction. I want you all to take just a minute and read these words up here. This one's titled, Less is More. If you would, just indulge me. Can you see it in the back? I'm trying to make a big enough font. Take, take, just take a read of that, if you would, please. Somebody throw up their hand when they're done. Just. Got it? Read it? Yeah, okay. Somebody shake their head, please, so at least I can. Yeah, got it. So what's your reaction? Yeah, I got it. I'm using quarter words, right? I had a boss once who said, why are you using all those quarter words when you can use nickel words? Synergistic approach to enhancing total enterprise value. Well, you know what? Business loves our words, though. We love cycles. We love... I'll call it the tchotchke of whatever it is today. When I started in business in the 80s, it was all about Kanban. It was all about TQM, total quality management, self-directed teams. Business loves the solution today that has some catchy, kitschy name. And right now, it's all about synergistic approach to adding value. I would say, what in the world does that mean? What, I what does this mean? My translation of this? because I've seen this from some of my colleagues, is, hey, we'll look at you and do a gap analysis and figure out how you can improve. Why would you say it with all those words? Less is more. In almost all cases, again, I go back to not just shut up and listen, but think about how you're going to present it. The cycles in business lend themselves to all these acronyms. It lends itself to all these methodologies and approaches, which are hot today and won't be hot next year. Self-directed teams. In the 1990s, I worked in internal audit, and the, the, the real hot approach was self-directed teams, meaning there would be no boss. The team would get together and figure out what to do. That's anarchy. The last time I checked, that's a recipe for disaster. Because if the five of us at this table are sitting around, I want what I want to get done. I want you to do it my way. Do we have self-directed teams today? No, we don't. Right now, one of the things that's going on across the business, I think due in a large part to the startups, is the elimination of performance ratings. I was just on a call this morning, we're talking about it. KPMG has eliminated performance ratings. Meaning that, and you have performance ratings, what are your performance ratings? Grades, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever, you know, in between. And we had one, two, three, four, five. One's good, five's bad, you're fired, get out of here. We're eliminating that. And now we're going to be a kinder, gentler, softer. You're just a great guy, Steve. You know what? I'm so glad you work with me. You are just an A plus person. Love you, buddy. Love you. That's what our performance evaluations are going to be. That's today. Come talk to me in five years. We may change. It will undoubtedly change because Google's done it, because Uber's done it, because a lot of the startups have done it. And I don't mean to sarcastically put it in a, in a, this is a bad thing, but it's the cycle of today. It's what we're doing. And one of the things we're, we're, we're doing in business right now is using big words, synergistic approach. What in the world does that mean? Talk to your colleagues. In my world, talk to your clients like you want to be talked to, as you would talk to others. Now, yeah, you have to step up your game. When we present to the board of directors, they want to hear in a certain framework, but it doesn't mean you have to come in with PhD-level words all the time. 
And your description should be colorful and meaningful, meaning they should convey an image, and they should be meaningful and applicable. They should be memorable. One of the things when I took Dale Carnegie years ago, they talked about how you should introduce yourself um, to be memorable. And, and we had, now I'm going to go and say this was her legitimate name, Luella Laflame was our instructor. And she painted a, a, a colorful uh, image of somebody named Luella Laflame. And I remember it, that was in 1985 I took that course. And I still remember it because it was colorful and meaningful. Less is more is just such a critical factor. I can't, again, back to several of the others, but if you can say it in less words, I highly recommend that you do. What more do I need to say? No whining. So I was on a flight yesterday. Gentleman sat next to me, it's a three hour flight. I I'm a little outgoing, it's what I do what I'm supposed to do. I like to talk to people, especially if I'm stuck behind, be, beside somebody. For, who, who flies? Anybody flies? Yeah, the seats have gotten smaller, haven't they? So you're up close and personal. And aside from handing out Tic Tacs, I, you know, I don't know what else to do. So I talked to the gentleman. Hey, how you doing? Where you I'm coming from San Diego. <coughs> oh, that's interesting. San Diego, beautiful town. Great. Oh, no. I had to fly out on San Diego on Monday. I had to go to this company meeting. You know, it's awards and events. And then I have to fly back. And I was in San Diego, and we were flying from Houston, and I got to fly. Oh, it's a shame. Sorry, bud. My back hurts now because I've been sitting in an airplane. So it's a shame. They probably did. They put you up at a nice hotel. Yeah, it was a Grand Hyatt. But you know, it wasn't this. It was. And I thought, where's the headphones? Where did I put my headphones? I don't want to talk to this individual. He's whining. Three hours of whining? Nah. In go the headphones, on goes the music. Hey, have a, have a nice flight, bud. Nobody wants to hear, I'll see, your whining, but our collective whining, right? And you will work with people who will tell you to no end. Yeah, I came in this morning and there was frost in the car and, you know, there was this and there was that and my bunions hurt and the dog, you know, chewed up something. And I'm like, yeah, thank you for oversharing, but Nobody likes to hear whining. And that doesn't mean you have to be, you know, completely up all the time and, and not share those things, but think about it consciously. As you work with a team, as you work with individuals, nobody likes a whiner. Don't be the whiner. So that was my eight items. <laughs> They're intended for humor as much as anything. However, you know, what I would also say is what we thought about these items and we thought about some of the key points around them, many times what happens is in business, we give you feedback on your technical skills and capabilities. How are you understanding accounting theory? How are you understanding IT? Are you doing the right things as it relates to filling out work paper? This is hard, and one of the reasons that we came up with these, to get to people like whining. Because no one wants to go tell the whiner, stop that. Or the Sheldon Cooper, hey, you're really arrogant and obnoxious in front of other people, you don't need to do that. Um, so we put a little humor behind them, but there's threads of truth in all of these. One of the key things I'll say is adaptation and change is vital. I've been doing this for enough years that you learn some core elements, and there's certainly some core components and some things that are very important but at the same time, you need to adapt and change. So what's important when you graduate will evolve. But there's some core skills, some core competencies in all these cases that I think you can take forward. But you need to adapt to the environment, to the job place, and to the people that you work with as well. The last one I I on this page is something that gets bannered about and it gets used and abused, and that's be genuine. People, particularly folks who have experience, I won't say older, because I don't like older. I like vintage myself. So those of us who have a vintage uh, era can see right through when they're being handed a line of BS very quickly. So I, as I said, I do campus interviewing. Went up to Penn State. 
Um, and I interview for technology positions at times. And one of my questions is typically, and I think you'd all appreciate this, technology runs a spectrum. Complete, heads down, network administrator, nerd, and I use that very friendly, to casual user. Interviewing one young gentleman who was a senior, had very good grades, had all the requisite skills it looked like, and I said, where would you place yourself on that spectrum? Mmm, glad you asked that, Mr. Archer. I'm a Unix master. There is nothing that anybody could teach me or tell me about Unix that I don't know. Oh, thank you very much, end of interview. I'm not gonna hire that guy. I'm gonna put that guy in front of one of my clients who has 30 years experience, <coughs> and guess what's gonna happen? My client's gonna eat them alive. Because yes, you may be incredibly smart. You may think yourself the master of all. You're not. You're not. You would be genuine as to who you are and understand both where you are in your career path, but also who you are and your natural, what comes comfort. Now, I'm all about expanding the comfort zone. I work with folks who don't wanna do what I'm doing right now, public speaking. But if you want to advance at my company, you need to, I'm a little over the top, so you, maybe you never be me doing this with you, but you need to be able to work with folks. You need to have what I call a POV, point of view. So we went and talked to the chief financial officer at Duquesne University because we thought we might work with them with a project. I brought one of my managers so we could build that rapport, had met the chief financial officer before. I brought my expert who was gonna do the project with me and my manager said two words. So we got done, went back to the office, and I said, Steve, what are you doing? Well, I, I, you know, we were gonna talk construction review, and I'm not a construction review guy. Um, I wanted John to talk. I said, no, time out, stop. We were talking Pittsburgh, Steelers, this was last December. We're talking weather. You need to have a point of view. Do you love the Steelers? Do you hate the Steelers? Do you like baseball better? Do you like hockey? Talk to our clients like you talk to your buddies. I know you have a point of view when you go out with your friends. You need to be genuine. So if you're gregarious and outgoing, do that. If you're an introvert, you might have to push the boundaries, but don't put yourself in a spot where you're gonna be here in front of people and you're just gonna be dying. So be genuine as to your, your, what you're comfortable with but also what your natural capabilities are. I wanted to leave you with a, a few key takeaways. A and these, I believe, are applicable, again, whether you're in my world of direct client service, doesn't matter whether you're a nurse, whether you're some other type of practitioner, regardless of what you do, always be mindful of the other person. And again, I'm, I'm not, singing kumbaya, we all have to get together that way. But as I said already, and if you haven't heard it, I'll emphasize it again. If you're talking and not listening and you're trying to understand the other person's point of view and where they're coming from, you're not going to get it. I think you should also be mindful of the other person because sometimes companies use interesting screening tactics or differing perspectives. So two points that we do. We used to have a receptionist. Maggie was phenomenal. She was just the nicest lady, understood everything about the company, had been there for, I don't know, 30 years. And so she would, when you came in the front door, that the first person you met, Maggie, if you came in for an interview, Maggie would say, James, sit down over here. I will get Rich and go back. Oh, Rich is on a call. He'll be with you in a few minutes. I know you had a 10 o'clock interview. Can you just wait for a few minutes? As a partner group, we would always ask Maggie, what would you think of James? It's a little obnoxious. He came in, didn't greet me. He stood there and acted like he was important. That was nowhere on the interview form. That was nowhere there. If you're not mindful of that other person, you lose. Be a good team member. So my daughter works um, PwC's wealth management tax area. What do you think tax people are doing this time of year? They're working six days a week, 12 hours a day, right? Great, it's a great, great work if you can get it. I think it's a phenomenal area, taxes and death. So be a nurse and be a tax accountant, you're gonna be employed for life forever. It's a great thing to be in. All kidding aside, one of their team members quit without a notice. 
That sucks. That's a that's a being a bad team member. You have a team lunch. You're like, well, I'm, uh, you know, I can't go with you guys. I'm too busy. You're going out for. Ch- I had a one of my team members said he only ate American food. We were going out for um, uh, Thai food. I said, well, what's American food? Like, be a good team member. Help out the team. Go to the team lunches. Work with the others. If somebody's looking for an idea, share it. And the worst things you can do is hold the information that you know and have to yourself and not share it, hoard it. And, and in today's environment, it's interesting to me because you know, with all of the access and online capabilities, someone else will find it. But if you have some information that's valuable to the team, you should share it. But be a good team member. That, that will just go a significant long way. A positive attitude masks a lot of gaps. I, and I don't mean that tongue in cheek as much as you can be a doofus and get away if you're just perky and happy. But my point being that when we look to hire folks off campus, or when I look to hire anyone at any level, what I'm looking for is a positive attitude and energy. I tell my team, we can, colloquially, I can peel somebody off the ceiling if they're energetic, positive, but I don't wanna have to kick somebody in the pants to get them moving along. And we can take that energy and channel it into the areas that we want them to work with and work on. But having a positive attitude, again, can joke about the no whining, but one of the things I've seen in my career over the years at all levels, in working with clients and working with bosses and working with other companies, people appreciate that. Not only do they want to work with people they like, they want to work with someone who's up, who enjoys, it's work, okay? They don't call it work for a reason, or they should, they do call it work for a reason. And if you any of us in the business, in the industry, won that big lotto, the Powerball, what does everybody say? I would quit working. So yeah, there's aspects of it that you might like. There's probably big aspects that you don't. I had to go to Newark, New Jersey, with all deference to Newark, New Jersey, in February two years ago. Not the place you want to be in February. But it's work. It's where we go. I could be in worse places. I could do worse things. Have a positive attitude. Look at the work as expanding your knowledge, your capabilities. Always be on the lookout for a new opportunity, a new experience. I think it was one of the deodorant companies. Never let them see you sweat. When the pressure's on, when you're under deadline, when you're working towards something diligently, everybody knows. If you're in a team and they're all working together and they're working hard, everybody realizes that. So again, I'll go back to, don't moan about it, don't complain about it. When the boss comes, and this is always a loaded question, right? And I know, I'm the boss, so you know, I, I, I got a big moniker. So when the boss says, are you busy? <laughs> yeah, mine isn't a loaded question, as in, well, if you're not, you should be, but it's legitimate. What I, what I both of these cases, what I'm not looking for is the moaning, the whining, the Oh, poor me, (laughs) I've got all this to do. I know you do, I sat in that chair not too many years ago. Be positive, don't get down on the experience. And and as you might have gathered from what I'm trying to get across today, one in doubt a little humor. Because nothing cuts through tension, nothing cuts through difficult. Um, Our world is a challenge because I will if one of you came to work for me in not too much long, within the first year, I will send you to a city you've never been to, to a company you've never worked with, and maybe we haven't worked with, to meet with a person you've never met, and within the first hour, I'm expecting that you're building credibility, gathering information, and building rapport so that we can be successful. That's the flip side of when you interview with me and say, I want a dynamic learning environment and I'm a people person. And that's my first response to you, which is, Given I'm going to send you to a place you've never been with people you've never been, how are you going to react to that? Little humor never hurts. When I go into that oral presentation discussion, and you can bet I'll do this in Cleveland next week, there will be people that I've never met. In fact, I've never met these people because we submitted the proposal. Everything's online these days, right? Of course it is. Of course it is. I emailed in the proposal. We had a conference call about the answers to my questions on it. They've never met me. Well, actually, they kind of have, because we've gone to pictures in our resumes. You know, there's always a bio in our proposals. They got pictures of me. 
And, I'll, and hold that thought for a minute because I don't like it, but it provides a great icebreaker humor item, which is when I go into this proposal discussion with people I've never met who are all staring at me. There's nothing worse, right? You, you four, great, great eye contact, thank you. But you're people I want to sell to, and you're looking at me like that, like, I, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you. That's a little intimidating, and it's a little, how do I break this ice and, and make you quit staring at me, um, as in what word's going to